So, you want to build a crib? Yeah. Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> Let's see what's going on. So, uh, what I'm going to, uh, I'm going to kind of start with the end. And I'm a uh, member of the KnotsMakers.org, or Knotts Makers group in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, we have a Cray XT3 cabinet, and uh, it's got XT4 blades inside at our makerspace. And so the last uh, portion of this talk is going, you know, how did we take this thing that had been surplused and bring it back to life? And so... There is going to be some, uh, how did we put Linux on that and some other things like that. So, uh, all right, but uh, I also work at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, which most of you probably know is the home of, I'll still call it the fastest computer in the world. It's number two right now. Uh, the name of the computer is Titan, and uh, it's a Cray XT7. Um, it's the successor to a machine called Jaguar. I worked on Jaguar, so I'll often uh, flip back and forth. Okay, sorry, going the wrong way. So, uh, we're right, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll learn this one. So, let me give you some of the numbers to impress you. So, in Titan, there are 18,688. 16 core AMD Opteron processors for a total of almost 300,000 cores. Okay, there for each CPU or um, processor, there's a matching K20X GPU. That's a computational GPU from NVIDIA. And each of those GPUs has a little over 2,500 cores by themselves. If you multiply that out, it's actually a little over 50 million. It's a big number. It's a big number. Um, there are 200 cabinets that compose this machine, and it has a theoretical max, if you, if you could get all that going in the same direction, of 27 quadrillion floating point operations per second. Uh, floating point operation per second, it's a flop. That's a 2.5 plus a 2.5 equals 5.0, that plus is a floating point operation. So writing it out, a petaflop is what we call a quadrillion flops. And so this is a quadrillion. I had to, uh, so thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillion. Okay, so it can do, you know, and we've demonstrated on a real problem, 17 and change petaflops. Who's counting a trillion? Uh, okay, but there's more at Oak Ridge. OR Nels also hosts the two other machines. Um, Kraken is owned by the University of Tennessee. And, well, there we go. Uh, Gaia is owned by NOAA. Both of these are in the top 50 machines in the world. Uh, Kraken topped out at number three, um, but it was a few years ago. And uh, we'll go into what's number one, number two, number three. What's that mean? But uh, let me give you a little server room tour here. So this is walking through the, uh, the server room where all these are. I don't know if any of you know Scott Milliken. Scott Milliken had invited me here to speak. He's the lab manager for all this room. And so he, this is what he does every day is uh, uh, watches these rooms. And so he had let us in and little did he know what he was getting himself into. But uh, yeah, this is Gaia from the side. And let me, um, each of the machines, you'll see this machinery, this stuff here on the le uh, left. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's really the refrigeration units for these things. Um, and uh, that's looking down that they have corridors of these racks and so actually yeah so you're seeing the you're seeing the back side of one rack and then the front side of the next rack going through so it's not back rack and back rack I don't think so they don't have cool and hot aisles that, that's weird that they wouldn't have that we do not 
And um, there's some interesting things. They have refrigeration built into the racks. They have yeah. refrigeration built so in, and the, the refrigeration, they're actually room neutral. And yeah. actually, they were room positive in terms of, uh, or room negative. Anyway, yeah. when they replaced that first rack, or the first machine, the XT3 and the XT4 were air cooled. Yeah. And uh, we'll get to what that meant to our makerspace, but these machines are um, water cooled and they have refrigeration units at the end that chill the air. But the air coming out of the top is actually neutral or actually cooler than the incoming air. So it, they, I heard yesterday that they actually cooled the room for a long time using their new Cray whenever they got it. So it's quite an air conditioner. Um, so here's Craig and looking at it. These are the, uh, those are heat units going over the, or cooling units sitting up here. And so, uh, and uh, now we... Is that all of it or is there more rows in there? Uh, that's just the front row that I'm showing you. Um, uh, Gaia just has well, How two. How Kraken? Uh, Kraken's about four rows. Um, it's roughly half of the uh, of Titan um, or it was roughly half of Jaguar um, let's see that's the front of Titan um, these are this is looking from that row to the back of the room and I'm it's hard to get perspective in here um, but you'll see those are seven more rows of identical set setups there and so a total of 200 racks he said, and uh, then we're, uh, this is the very back of the room. You can see the refrigeration lines a lot better going over the top, cooling the racks. And, uh, is that him in the picture? Uh, Scott was with me. This isn't Scott there. This is another I couple friends of mine. Yeah, yeah uh, but we were like, you guys Japanese. don't know, that's Dolomite. That's classified. They might know him better by his hacker name. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but yeah, I took uh, the guy in the uh, lighter colors is a Pellissippi State local community college student that's been helping me out, and uh, he was just oh, yeah. <laughs> all his geek dreams came through yesterday. He was just oh, he got to go into Sea yeah, Titan, nice. and then um, later we went to Buda Cray. So uh, it's very loud in this room. Hearing protection is required. This next um, one is a movie walking down the front of Titan. So I don't know. Anyway, it's very, it's just really loud. It's fine. I have a couple more. Yeah. Oh, handy dandy. Okay. Don't press the button. button. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> well, just the audio before you plug that in. Yeah, it's going to get really loud. It'll be one to one match. Remember the scene from Back to the Future? <laughs> Next. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so we say it's the fastest in the world, but says who? And uh, so there's a top500.org, the group, um, they list, they've been listing the top supercomputers in the world for I don't know how long, it's, it's a list that's published twice a year. And um, the rankings are by flops achieved on a matrix calculation, linear algebra. And uh, a little hard to read, but Jack Dongara was the author of LinPack, which is the the benchmark used. He's a distinguished scientist at ORNL and a distinguished professor at UT, and his signature is here. And uh, he's one of the um, founding fathers of uh, scientific computation. Uh, currently, the Chinese military is ranked number one. That was a list that just came out like a month ago. It's issued twice a year. Um, this is the certificate for Titan that hangs on the wall. At um, at ORNL, and so it's saying 
is ranked number one among the world's top 500 supercomputers with a 17.5 petaflop limpack performance. So, oh. Okay, and uh, so that's who says who. Um, I'm gonna live. So this is my credibility. Is to, this is what I worked on on um, Jaguar and uh, now Titan. It's a model called Glimmer Sism, and I did the parallelization for this. So it was a effectively a serial or a scalar model that then um, we parallelized so it can run on any of the parallel architectures. It was parallelized using um, MPI. We'll come to. And so um, the ice sheet model, and so this is for land ice sheets. So think Greenland, Antarctica, big land ice, not sea ice. It uh, calculates a set of P PDEs, or partial differential equations for ice thickness, movement, mass balance, all these different things. That's the mathematical expressions of the uh, PDEs um, for some of them. It's really Navier-Stokes. And then this is uh, an example of some of the outputs. So that's all of Greenland showing um, velocities of different um, portions of the ice sheet. Wrong. The... Greenland's much bigger than that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the scale. Yeah, right. <laughs> I should put that at the bottom. Not the scale. <laughs> Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so for solving PDEs, I'm not going to try to stretch your uh, Thank you. mathematical um, you remembrance it's very much. <laughs> but the overall idea is that you do have this volume of something. And so you're trying to calculate the volume of, or not the volume, but a, a temperature field, let's say, over space. So three space. Sure. Um, that's X, Y, and Z. And what you're doing is converting that through a stencil to calculating your derivatives and the x, y, z directions. You calculate all these, or you write down all of these um, relationships between all the different nodes, and you'll end up with a set of indexed equations like that that are you have to solve simultaneously across all those. Rewriting as a matrix. It simplifies the uh, look. Um, with PDEs, you often get this diagonal. Everything else off of here is uh, so, zeros. Yes? Let me actually grab the mic. So when you were uh, taking this to a parallel model, were you doing, were, was it the matrix algebra that was being parallelized? What, what step of this was uh, being parallelized? Sure. Um, it was all the math, all the... The model had been done and proven for, yeah, yeah. small size. Sure. Um, what it was really doing was splitting it up, and um, so that, as far as each, and so what I was doing was taking that small model and replicating it thousands of times, and then handing each of those small models a portion of whatever ice. Is, we're, is the code up? Is the code open source, or at least source visible? It is part of the what's called the CESM okay. from NCAR, and that is right. publicly available, but you have to sign a yeah, license I, I, type yeah. of thing. Okay, cool. okay, so it's part of that repo. Okay, so uh, anyway, that's my credibility. So let's go into the components of a Cray, and. Uh, so I heard some of you already say, I am going to speed up my gaming system and get me a Cray processor, <laughs> and man, <laughs> you know that. And uh, Seymour Cray was the designer, that's where the name came from, um, and uh, the, uh, founders of the founder of the company. And he, a quote from him, anyone can build a fast CPU, and, uh, but the trick is to build a fast system. And I heard you mention the CDC 6400? 6500. 6500, thanks. Um, so he, before um, starting his own, starting Cray, he uh, worked with uh, CDC, Computer Control Data? Control Data. Control Data, thank you. Control Data Corporation. And 
there he was designing the fastest systems in the world. And he was meticulous about all the other pieces that go into making a system fast. You can make a really fast processor, but you can starve it in so many ways that your, your throughput is nothing. And so that was his, his thing. Um, 1970, six, five, four, somewhere in there, uh, early 70s, he was at CDC. Um, let's see, and uh, you guys look like an audience that can appreciate some uh, vacation pictures. So uh, this is the Cray One, uh, serial number three. It is at um, National Center for Atmospheric Research in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And last summer we were visiting, we were in Colorado, we stopped and saw the Cray, so that's my family standing in front of that Cray, it's still on display. Uh, it was bought in, it was delivered in 1977, it was almost nine million dollars. Uh, I like this, seven million dollars for the machine, plus a million dollars for the disc. That just cracks me up for some reason, like, oh, you want a disc with that? You know, I don't, I don't know, I just picture the DOS disc coming with it, and it's like, uh. Anyway, they priced it like, maybe we'll sell ten, you know, and so that's why they were priced crazy and they ended up selling over 80, and it was at least twice as fast, and maybe four, I think it was like about four and a half times as fast as the CDC oh, yeah. oh, machine yeah. oh, at yeah. the time. Oh, yeah. um, so, some of the other things that you can see in this picture are, this is the cooling built around the bottom in this bench, Down here. and so Cray integrated cooling as part of his designs, and then this is basically memory. It's, it's, what if, it's just sticks of memory, and it's packed really, really tight, and they're just stacked up wow. inside of there. And it was one processor, but it was, uh, yeah, we'll uh, see the specs here on the next slide. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. I love this. your <laughs> All right. Um, and so, what I'm replicating here, this is another poster at uh, Incar, and so it's this text down here is comparing the Cray to uh, iPhone 3G at the time. Um, but I also wanted to point out this picture here. It'll come back up in a little while. There's about five or six guys pushing this machine around. So, you can maybe imagine where this is going to come up later. Um, Seymour Cray is pictured in here. He's that dot right here. Um, okay, so 80 megahertz clock speed. There's, there, it was a balanced vector processor and scalar. And so a lot of the machines could do one or the other at the time, but not both very well. Or they had really deep pipelines or whatever. Couldn't switch. So it was one million 64 bit words of memory. So it was 64 bit. Whoever right, was yeah. saying 60. Yeah, you know, you were right. That's okay. 60. Okay. The, Could 60, have been. the 65 the 6500 was a 60 bit word. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it could achieve 80 megaflops. It could do that and then peak it it could go up to 160 megaflops. Um, so that's a million 160 million floating point operations per second. It weighed five and a half tons. It's kind of why I like this picture up here, these guys pushing it around. And, uh, you know, so, and iPhones 1.4 sits times 10 to the negative fourth tons. In case you were wondering, that was kind of fun to work out this morning. Um, okay, so on processors, uh, Seymour Cray held that uh, computers should obey a square law. When the price doubles, you should get at least four times as much speed. He really had this bias. He wasn't done until he could deliver with each generation 10 times more processor performance. And that actually drove a lot of his companies and corporations to into the ground. Okay. <laughs> he went broke at least three times. He and it, it's a really it's a really interesting history. He was He's a, he's a neat guy. Go look up the article on Wikipedia. Um, and his drive to deliver that performance forced the company into really exotic research. And so they were the first looking at gallium arsenide. 
now the processors are AMD Optron, 16 core, they're big, we, not a lot of us probably have them, but we could go get them if we wanted to, so they are a commodity. Um, and uh, let's see, so another thing about Cray was that he resisted the massively parallel, and so there's another quote from him, if you're applying a field, which would you rather use, two strong oxen or a 1,024 chicken? Um, and I think I've seen that recently on like Google Plus is like a question or something. But was it due to complexity that he didn't like massively parallel, or why did he hate the future? He um, he was very you know, So he was a designer. He was the architect. Um, and, yeah, this kind of 1,024 chickens is kind of, he didn't like, he wanted, he wanted those horses. Oh my, okay, sorry, sorry. okay, we'll try this one. Okay, um, and so it was his personal bias, and it was just something that he could not, yeah, yeah could not get around, and yeah. it took a long time for him. Um, he, uh, He's been dead 15 years. Yeah, it was the mid-90s, 96, I think yeah. is when he was killed in a car accident. Um, by the mid-90s, what had been catching up was compiler technology, because yeah. it was phenomenally difficult to program sure. anything, <laughs> you know, and then trying to yeah. program 1,024 chickens would be yeah. a lot harder. <laughs> um, but by the mid '90s, compiler support was catching up. Yeah, getting better. Okay, and so in um, the mid '90s, he started a new company to design his his first uh, massively parallel machine, and there again, true to his his design, his architecting, he wasn't focused on the processors, but he was focused on all the bottlenecks around it the communications, the memory, bench, our performance. And uh, that was no small part of it. It was not, still is not, and that still remains a focus of Craig. Um, so uh, getting to massively parallel. Um, mainly, well, this is diving down through history and really going through a processor. So we all know we've got a processor, we've got a computer, we can make it do something. And then a lot of us had dual processors, so it's like, but you really kind of could treat it like two computers and it was just in the same box. And so, computer to computer, you're, I need to tell you something, you need to tell me something, then that's handled through something called MPI, or Message Passing Interface, and uh, it's libraries, it's function calls, you can go download it, you can read the book, and uh, <laughs> Jack Dongara, yeah, no, it's not too bad. I've, I've read him. Uh, Jack Dongara is, this was a big project of his also. And, uh, but then something happened. We hit the make, or the gigahertz uh, um, wall, whatever you want to call it, and we just, you know, you're hitting a thermal barrier, you're hitting a lot of things. And so the, our CPU manufacturers started multiplying cores. And, uh, but cores aren't computers. And so what you're speeding up with the core, or what you want to do with the core is threads. And so you're doing threads, you're doing, you want to split up, and so then all 16 of your cores can go running off doing something at the same time. So you've got parallel inside of your computer, inside of your CPU, and so there are the techniques of threads, fork join, that kind of thing and the uh, library is called OpenMP. And it's really not a library, it's a computer, a compiler extension. Yeah. And so you're putting comments in that you say, this nets for loop, do this. You can split this 25 ways if you want. Well, some more vector units. And so you're splitting out. Um, so that has to do with your floating point operations. And so many cores have cores can have multiple vector units with them. Well, if you're trying to stream vectors and do calculations, then, yeah, so think vectorization, SSE extensions, that kind of stuff. Again, it's 
It is CPU instructions, but also you're really still looking at the compilers. GPUs have thrown another wrinkle in there, <laughs> a huge, an immense wrinkle for us science, scientific com computational scientists. Yes. How, how would FPGAs stack up in this with with uh, vector math? <clears throat> it should. That's my my research. That it um, I mean, I'm thinking specifically support vector machines. Okay. I know the term. I know of it, but I. Really, it's a regression model. Yeah. Um, later. Regression. Let's. Yeah, I, yeah. I've got friends that love FPGAs, and yeah, you know, I would, and they would probably love to talk with you too. Right. But uh, uh, it's less a specialty <laughs> of mine. Um, so GPUs have thrown a huge wrinkle. It's like yeah. making us rethink all this again. But you know, think about what you're throwing away. If you've got your serial program that you rocked you know, the Cray-1 or whatever, you had that serial program massively parallel, sure. split out. Okay, well, two CPUs, that's okay. You got along. Cores, well, I'm just going to ignore them. Well, now you've thrown away, you know, a good, you know, some multiple of that machine's performance. If you said, oh, I don't have any vectorization, you're throwing away another multiple of the machine's performance and so on. And GPUs, well, they give us a lot. They're very different, They're very different to, uh, to try to get a hold of. And there, CUDA, OpenACC is an extension. OpenCL is another. OpenACC's uh, directive is very much like OpenAP. Okay, um, I had debugging, profiling, challenges that you face when you're doing massively parallel. You're doing tens of thousands of processes, a lot of, you know, that's that'd be quite a lot for Visual Studio to split out your debugger. They're, they're specialty um, software and support so that you can be assured that your calculations are doing what you want them to do. And the word that comes up in all this is scalable. Problems or algorithms that can be a, that can effectively use this um, massively parallel computing. So uh, for summarizing the uh, parallel, I like the, and so in 77 is when they deliver Cray delivered the, uh, the Cray 1A. In 78, the, so the Cray operating system used to be programmed by Cray. The uh, automatically vectorizing, the first automatic, automatically vectorizing Fortran compiler was delivered in the Cray assembly language. And uh, Cray's had a long heritage in the compiler technology. Um, they're still tuned. Know, to their machines, they still do a lot of development in compilers, but they are tuned and applicable only to a Cray. They remain cutting edge, taking the performance technologies, but I've got a GPU system. We can get awesome performance on the problem on a Cray, but it has to run on Windows. And we're like, do you all have a Windows edition of your Cray? Maybe? <laughs> and they don't. But I would sure love one. Um, I've already mentioned MPI, OpenMPI um, is an open source version. MPICH is also open source, freely available. What's open source? Um, OpenMPI. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. CL, yeah. How do you like MPI versus CL? They're actually uh, different critters, I think. But let me. Uh, yeah, table. Uh, anyway, OpenMP, P threads. Um, and that's really where we're living in terms of our CPUs and our computers is, is at the thread level. And, um, and so .NET language, you know, really Intel, most of the industries here dealing with threads. Um, the, the other things are free, CUDA, GCC, and so on. But um, moving along, um, massively parallel machine, lots of processors. I like that we had our. Uh, so how can we uh, how can we network and communicate between all these nodes? And so thinking we've got the uh, NSA proof telephone design here, and so you can string <laughs> out right one to the next. And what you need to be able to do is to easily. I I need to add another cabinet. Well, you know that's this design certainly comes to mind. You know that that would make it really easy to join in, but. 
this guy needs to get a message to that guy, it's got to go through a guy in the middle, and you know, that's a lot of strings and pink cans. Um, so the Nets design, all these designs were tried over a period of time that nobody knew what to do right. And so they were just trying anything. This was kind of a, I was trying to diagram what's called a fat tree. And so down here, these guys can communicate. You make, as you get closer to the root, you make the, uh, the bandwidth fatter. So then you can have constant up and down bandwidth between the processors and still be able to join things together. In the middle is a hypercube. There were a hypercube, or that's a four-dimensional cube. Um, How do you do that connection? Well, hold on. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, what you, you know, there were all these different designs, and we're actually going to do an exercise here in a few minutes. Um, a completely connected, you know, because then you could say, well, this should be the best, right? Because now every processor is only one hop away from you. And so that should be the right design. But it's immensely complex to add a new machine. In every machine, you have to completely connect it to all the machines that were there before. But it was a, a lot of machines, a lot of companies. Um, but I uh, promised an exercise here. So uh, Cray T3D, mm, late 90s, 98. Um, and uh, stands the T3D stands for three-dimensional torus. And so, bonus points if you all knew that torus is the mathematical name for the, like the skin of a donut, okay? And so this is a three-dimensional torus. Everybody see the donut in the uh, diagram? No, part of it. Sure. <laughs> okay? Yeah. All right, so think of the, the grid, the layers, okay, running this way. And so just an XY grid, all these connected up. And now uh, I'm going to have to put the mic down to do this. All right, I'll try to talk loud. Okay, so we've got the grid laid out like this. All right, now what we're going to do is join the edges. Because whenever you get to here, well, what do you do with this dangling bit? You know, where's this wire connect from this guy? What you're going to do is loop it around to the bottom. <coughs> And so by doing that, then I've connected the wires top to bottom here. Well, then I'm going to, if you loop it around, then you would get a donut shape, okay? What I've done with that is just one layer. So now think of lots of layers. And so you're trying to solve PDEs in three-dimensional space, right? So you're going up, down, left, right. That's yeah. YZ, okay? And so, do the same. We've got the top and the bottom. All right, so we're gonna join. You like got a mess. The Y, so let's see if I can keep the top visible here. So we got the X and Y, and now what you need to do is reach into four dimensional space and just pull the Z around and connect it. Where, where's the fourth dimension coming from? Is it because there's it's multiples a, of these? Yeah, and so what you're needing to do, X and Y would make so it's a like bunch of donuts donut. shelled inside of each other, right? Okay. But in four space, if you think like a mathematician, yeah. there's another, the top and the bottom would be free just like these are. Right. <laughs> Whenever you're joining them. But you can't, you can't embed this in three space. Right. <laughs> So, so that's, it wasn't quite a hypercube. Hypercube's a four-dimensional extension of a cube. Yeah, cube, yeah, right. Okay, and so then that's, but you can see the efficiency for PDEs is that very often you need to talk to your neighbors north, south, east, west, and up and down. And so that's the communication flow that transfers, that works well. Okay. Um, and uh, those are the types of problems often solved on the Cray's or the fluid dynamics type of um, problems. Uh, let's see. And so, summarizing the interconnects, um, C-Star was their previous technology. 
Gemini is its current technology. The Gemini for the Cray is represented here. It's showing very fat pipes in different directions, and so it was an upgrade to the to the Sea Star. And um, but these interconnects are exotic; they're unique to Cray. You couldn't just get one and hook it to your PC, and it wouldn't make any sense. But um, and uh, something I learned while putting this talk together from uh, the person who owns our Cray at the Makerspace is that I was griping about whenever I was working with Jaguar, and then it would be like, Ugh, stopped. Ugh. And then you would have to wait a couple hours, and then it would be going again. And what he said was that whenever the C star, the C star had no recovery. And so whenever you like dropped a node, something went with one of those chips then you lost the whole machine, you lost the whole topology. No more communication could occur, the only thing to do was go and like pull the plug and you know, restart it. Uh, Gemini can reroute and recover, and so it can flush the network, get it back to a previous known good state, route those out, whatever was failing, and then recover. And so it um, added robustness, and as you go massively parallel, you've got to I've got to do that. <laughs> you know, and so, and, uh, but overall, the giggy switch for most of our calculations is good enough for us. We can all get that. Uh, a few more components, moving along, data storage. Um, so, interesting thing. So, the compute nodes are effectively net booted, and they run from a RAM disk. They don't have any hard drive. Uh, I got into the word huge here. Huge data sets are required for initial data. So when you're trying to get that problem started, you've got all these processors and they're ready to calculate, but they need whatever they need to calculate on that initial data. You've got huge output. And uh, so you've got throughput. If it's all waiting for data to be written to disk and you're just sitting around, you're getting no throughput um, for your, uh, through your machine. And then, you know, it's a huge potential bottleneck. You know, that initial data loaded across all the compute nodes. So imagine 200,000 computers just sitting around waiting for the hard drive. You know, we get frustrated when one computer is sitting around waiting for the hard drive. 200,000 all waiting for it. And uh, so the solution, it's a very active area of research. What you want is a parallel file system. And so you want, like, one file open for 200,000 processors. and all of them can pull in at the same time their portion of these huge files. And so Luster is the name of the file system we're using at um, Oak Ridge. And we'll have a picture here on the next one of our file system. And so the current file system is 14,000 SATA drives. Um, it is a RAID 6 technology or redundancy. And so you've got eight disks plus two spare. Um, and I asked yesterday, so there's 10 to 20 hard drive failures per month, which I thought was remarkably low. <laughs> 14,000 SATA drives. They said it's been ticking up. This is uh, about three or four years old, so it's starting to tick up. It's being replaced. Um, and so this is a picture of the new system. There's 20, a little over 20,000 two terabyte SAS drives storing a total of 32 petabytes spinning, okay, so, and a 1.2 terabyte per second transfer rate. And uh, this, this is, um, um, I call it beer cooler, but yeah, they, they push the cold air up through here and then it exhausts out through the machine. So this is a cold environment and then the rooms um, not, all air conditioned cooled and it's really cold in this room and so these are just hard drives and i got this picture when we were in there yesterday this side the supercomputers this side of the room see these pillars is all storage and uh, i wanted to give a different perspective this is from the outside of the room and so if you go to the nccs to observe the computers there's the pillars. You can just barely see the top of the computers there. And the, the other third of the room is just hard drives. It's just data. 
And uh, how many megawatts an hour does this thing burn? How many power plants? <laughs> yeah, same no question. Yeah. We're going to actually we'll go answer that. It. It's a fun. Yeah. I was curious too. Okay, so <laughs> we'll finish up a couple more components here. Um, so programming, operating systems. We've gone through a lot of it, but uh, somebody. So Cray OS was <laughs> proprietary. It's now Linux. It's SUSE. So it's a version of SUSE Linux. It's been modified. The network stack especially has been changed. And so it's called Cray Linux environment, Duh. or the CLE. Uh, yeah, so um, Cray compilers. There's also other companies that operate in the uh, high performance computing realm, PGI or Portland Group. It's a compiler company. Intel is more pushing down towards the threads. They're not really helping us a lot in these crazy rarefied air environments. Um, libraries, we've talked about a lot of these, so CUDA and so on, and the debugging tools. And this is my favorite out of all of them. This is called Vampire. It's from a university in University of Dresden. But what you're seeing here are MPI communication patterns going here. You're getting a visualization of, oh, wait a second. You know, my, my computer's sitting idle for all this red time. How can I get it to computing? And being able to look and visualize across all those thousands of processes, why am I getting, so you how could I could improve my performance? So you have GCC compilers. Is there anything for LLVM, or is that totally outside the space? It is not outside the space. And uh, <laughs> there's... LLVM seems to be taking over the world right now. Yeah. Um, let me think about my answer to that one. Okay. I would love, um, because there's, yeah. So you can do GCC. What we've done a lot, one compiler won't find something that another compiler will in GCC and G Fortran. Yeah. Do a lot of Fortran program. Fortran rocks, okay. Um, <laughs> so that's a lot of the programming, scientific programming, is still done in Fortran. Um, now that somebody asked about power, power cooling and infrastructure, I'm throwing them all together to get through them. Uh, integrated cooling, again, it was a Seymour Cray design feature. He, he integrated it from his earliest designs, and Crays will not operate. They'll check the environment, they'll come up, and the very first thing they'll do is check that environment and make sure that the environment's satisfactory to whatever it needs. And uh, there's an environmental interlock that will not run if you know, it loses air conditioning or whatever. And uh, Cray knew the, he needed to shut his computers down if he lost cooling, but he didn't have the interlock the other way. And uh, so there is a story of a frozen computer that they lost power. The computer stopped computing, but the cooling didn't. And so whenever they came in the next morning, they came into a frozen ice cube <laughs> of a Cray. Um, somebody asked about Cray, or power. 8.3 megawatts um, was used for the Linpack whenever they did their Linpack top 500 run. Right. So everything's lit up and running. So if I did my math right, okay, uh, 8,300 kilowatts times an hour, and so 8,300 kilowatt hours, hopefully. Uh, I don't know how much they pay. Our industrial rate in uh, East Tennessee is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's a thousand, almost a thousand, or $1,100 per hour power bill, multiplying it out $26,000 a day, and three quarters of a million dollars per month just for power for this. Um, what has become much more um, concerning, um, important, is the uh, thermal efficiency. How much are you getting, how much computing are you getting per watt uh, power use? And Titan actually ranks like number two or number three on that list. So it is very efficient, but it's huge. And, uh, um, and power is really also a constraint to exascale. What comes after petascale? Exascale. An exaflop is a thousand-fold increase to a petaflop, okay? Um, 
And so if you just scaled all your numbers, then you're needing 8.3 gigawatts, and that is multiple nuclear power plants to power your one computer. Yeah, we haven't said anything. Infrastructure, the maintenance, all the space, all that stuff. So there's a lot of costs that go into it, and so people often ask, well, why'd you have to retire it? Why'd you have to turn it off? And uh, so that uh, can give a reason. Uh, so summary, Crays are wonderful machines, but they're designed for a problem set that not a lot of us have. Um, there's several exotic components, but the ones that impact us are commodities. And uh, our phones and computers and all the things we have are wonderful little parallel computers. You can get into parallel computing that way. I did. Programming, did my PhD research on my Mac 8 core machine, and uh, that experience translated clear up to running on the Cray. And so most of the software and resources used on the Cray are freely available. You, anybody can get them. Building your own Linux cluster is something we can all do. This is, uh, this is an example of one. I had two high school students over the summer, and we rehabilitated, rehabilitated an old um, uh, just a Linux cluster. It's about 30 Dell 1850s or older machines, but and they can max out at like three gigs of memory, but they still make a decent um, compute. A parallel computer environment. Yeah, parallel MPI computer environment. So we talked about the big Cray. Um, let's talk about the Cray at the makerspace. So here it is, um, pictured. And um, I've got the, the front cover off so you can see inside. What there are is um, there's what's called three chassis. And so these run these ways, this, this way. So one, two, three. And those are like three separate racks, sort of. Um, there's eight blades per um, chassis. And then inside each chassis, there's four nodes or four um, modules and um, what these with the holes on them are kind of the the IO nodes or the startup nodes and so you're seeing the wires going in out of this chassis um, only the bottom row is fully populated with memory and uh, this is we said it was net booted this is an Asus desktop machine that's <laughs> providing the boot and root and all the management of the Cray cluster there Let's see, what else? Um, above that is an InfiniBand fiber optic Cisco switch. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. And so there's a total of 98, 96 nodes per cabinet. All right, um, so what do you do with one of these when you win it at auction? Well, it did sit at, in their garage at their house, and you know, he did have a Cray in his garage, and uh, he did ask his wife first before uh, winning the Cray. Um, it weighs 1,500 pounds. It was bought at surplus for $750. Wow. And uh, I promised a little story. He told me, he said, uh, it took eight guys whenever he, to push it onto the moving truck. And so that reminded me whenever yes. the other guys were pushing around the other Cray. Um, he said they were a lot smarter when they got the home. They took all the blades out, took all the sides off, and then you just had like a 300 pound rack that they could go down the uh, ramp with. Um, so, there was just, I didn't know anything about the Cray being bought that he was going to try to move it to the makerspace or anything until there was just this explosion of just really arcane, weird power discussion that came up on the, the email list. <laughs> And they started talking about three phase, and well, how many amps can you get out of a blah, blah, blah. And, uh, so it turned out that this was the discussion for how do you power a Craig? <laughs> so it is three phase, 208 volts. We needed an electrician to come and install that. They spec that they want a 100 amp circuit. Try to get in a 100 amp circuit from TVA. We have a 30 amp circuit. Um, and what, yeah, the, this is the power module at the bottom. Um, 
and it delivers to the machines, it's delivering 52 volts DC at 62 amps. Um, it uses about three and a half kilowatts just sitting idle. Um, and so it costs us about 60 cents an hour to run. I was like, that's not bad. And then I multiplied it out and it's like 15 bucks a day. Eh, okay. But then it's $400 a month. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And that's not including anything else. Okay, so cooling. Um, so another of the discussions that was going around was how are we going to cool this thing? And it's like, well, we could use a single phase car fan, you know? And so there were just all these crazy things going around. Um, we were able to use the original 2200 cubic foot per minute um, fan on a three phase motor because we did get three phase power. There is a 15 degree Fahrenheit temperature rise between the incoming and the exhaust air. And so I multiplied out, well, we have 25,000 cubic feet square cubic feet space at the uh, Oak Ridge Entrepreneurial Center where we're located, and so we can turn over all the air in the room and heating it up by 15 degrees in 12 minutes. <laughs> all right. Uh, so this is a compute blade, and I have one up here. Um, the, I'll hold it up here, and y'all can come and see it. I'm trying to get to the end here. So the C-Star interconnects are down here at the end, memory slots, and then four CPUs. These were only single CPU machines, the four nodules, modules. But notice what's not on here. You don't see a lot of other support, ship, anything else. Yeah, this is a remarkably, I'm gonna pick this up. A remarkably clean board. Okay, so that necessitates that you have to push everything to the board. Everything goes over as you're trying to boot it. These are the interconnects in the back. You open up the back of the crate, and there's all these wires. <laughs> Looks like the board or something. Um, and yeah, you can't really see it, but these are labeled X, Y, and Z. This is where you would wire to the Nets guy to create that three-dimensional torus. That's all the communications power and stuff. Well, no, the power is that blue ribbon going up the side. It's the uh, DC voltage. That's just communication lines going through those umbilical cords. So here it is. Again, a couple more publicity photos. Is there a control blade, or how do you get a terminal? Starting it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. All right. I've got 30 seconds to do it. <laughs> here, we get sound anywhere? Yep. You hear it? Okay. Yeah. Start over, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> okay. This uh, <coughs> this video is about two and a half minutes long. This was from very initial just clickety clickety click telling the chassis to start its power up sequence. <clears throat> the fans coming on, as you see by the indicator, and you'll start seeing these are the control nodes down in here. And so you're going to bring up one um, while we're waiting for the lights to start going blinky blinky. <laughs> um, a few other notes are that um, the this one takes about 20 minutes to boot. Yeah. Jaguar took an hour to boot. <laughs> it brings up, what they do is they have to push all of the BIOS, all of the boot, they have to bootstrap it in 4K <coughs> chunks to one node. And they'll bring up one node, that takes an hour. And Titan now, because of all the GPUs and extra checkouts, takes two hours to boot one node. What? it takes 30 seconds to boot the next 18,000. So, you know, it works out on average, not too bad, but, um, I don't, are any lights blinking yet? Please, come on. Yeah, a little bit. Um, we've got a few, we'll get a, there's a row of lights after, all it's doing right now is checking the environment. You know, I kept like, all right, we got lights. Whew. 
Okay, <laughs> good. Um, and so it's really just going through like yeah. all the hardware here, what's here, what's going on, hey, are we gonna run? I don't know, well, I feel like it. Yeah, yeah let's do it. <laughs> Woohoo! And oh, I kept thinking, all right, are we done yet? No. Okay, and then he's like, no, it's like you've turned your car on and it's decided that it is a car. <laughs> and But you haven't started it. You haven't gotten there yet. You know, it's just kind of checked. And Okay, so that fan's pretty quiet. Um, we're going to do another video. So now the blowers come up and then that's full speed. So this one's not very long. Um, that's about finished. Okay. Here's a few of the screens. I'm sorry they didn't translate. You can come up or yeah. didn't don't show up clear, but it's basically the commands to start powering this baby on. Um, you can see a reflection there in the glass of the owner. Um, we're at another stage. It uh, has reported the machines there, and uh, let's see. I think I've got. Basically, this should look a lot like a Linux boot window. Sort of, yeah. and you're seeing a lot of uh, timestamps and things going by, so okay, it's booting failed, Linux. Okay, failed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, here we go. I hope this one, I'm actually going to try to do it from up here, because it's important to get this last part. Uh, with that very profound Mike. announcement. Mike. What's that? Sorry. Uh, with that very profound um, comment from me, because I just rebooted. Huh. <laughs> okay. So, you had to be there. With that very profound insight. I, I was there. I like the big crescent wrench behind your. Uh, ah, you like on, that? On, okay. on your so, picture there. Well, good. So, anyway, <laughs> all right, uh, so I'll call for questions. So, how do you control it? You just like tell it the serial console on it or. The, I saw the Mac, but like, yeah, the only machine over here that <coughs> the controller is this ASUS desktop. So we so it is just a machine. It's just a machine, and then you're telling instructions to the cons to the chassis. There are microcontrollers in the chassis for environmental, all that, and you're actually bringing up 486 controllers on each of <laughs> like the the chassis being the horizontal thing. So there's a 486 there. Then you get to start booting the AMDs and the blades, and so then you get to, we're booted after 20 minutes. Yes, uh, over here. Yeah. In the hackerspace build, what are you using for your data storage? It's actually in that, uh, he's, he's using the, that ASUS, and so there is, um, that's a component he didn't get was the, uh, like the storage something Imagine unit, that. and so, uh, so what is it, like NFS or something? There, it's NFS, there's things, like, yeah, and so you're doing that. It's InfiniBand is coming back. It's, uh, so. Yes? So, I mean, it's in, in the age of these commodity super clusters like Hadoop and a lot of the others, do you mm -hmm. think there's still going to be a place for these bespoke machines for too much longer? It's a good question, and you know, we keep making them bigger and faster, and getting bigger and faster problems and uh, or problems needing bigger. And so there is, there was like a supercomputer collapse in the late nineties that a lot of machine art companies went bankrupt, but there are, but they're, they're exotic problems. You know? And so it's, it's not, it is, kind of, it's a great question. <laughs> it well, could be subject to a lot of it, uh, discussion. It seems to me that, the, that as far as corporate is concerned, they're going to go down the Hadoop train. Yeah. As far as scientific computing, well, so a lot of those problems, I wouldn't want to put uh, those through uh, a map reduce process. It would just, it would be adding an unnecessary complexity. Yeah, and so business problems do not necessarily map into cray space. They are, 
they right. are yeah. they are esoteric that way. So, but we do still have a lot of big national, international importance problems that need it. Yes. What was the the smallest like problem set that's like gone through one of your clusters and like the longest like time running wise? Is it like somebody jumped with like a five minute problem like because of the, the the load or? Um, it's. They are shared, uh, uh -huh. so that's something about it is queuing. You really? And that's um, because it doesn't make sense to have this humongous machine. And you've got one guy running one processor and doing "Hello World," <laughs> and um, and, um, and so what you're doing is that there's a queuing management system. So then you submit and you say, "I need a thousand processors," and believe it or not, you'll get it back. I've run up to. 20,000 processors interact on my code, and it allocates out of the giant pool, it will allocate 20,000 processors, and then you ask for an amount of time, and then you have it, and then when your time's up, they all go to somebody else. Is it, uh, still, was it AQS or something, the, the queuing system? Uh, the queuing system, um, Torque and Maui, is used that's open, partially open source. There's um, so Tort Maui Cray really has their own queuing system, but it maps just like open source ones are available. So <coughs> if that helps any, but yeah, it does an amazing job of being able to allocate all these resources and yeah. get your code over there and somehow map that. Well, here's your scratch disk space. Put your data here. These things can see the data and. The blasted thing works. It's amazing. So. Uh, is there much documentation available for the architecture or methodology be behind the interconnects? And if uh, not, was there an NDA signed when you acquired that? This blade? <laughs> um, this is out of the Makerspace one. He let me bring it over here. I'm sorry. I can, he said, I can handle it. <laughs> Y'all can come and look at it. But you, yeah, and um, if he's under an NDA to. No, um, but there are licensing. And so uh, he has a hobbyist license as a Cray. <laughs> You're a hobbyist owner of a Cray. And so he had to have a hobbyist license from Cray for him to get the software for his Cray. So I, I do find that funny. All this stuff is talked about in the literature. So Dragonfly, he said, is the Nets, um, network topology. And so before we had up, down, left, or XYZ. Apology. Dragonfly has smaller pipes going around, but then it goes in more directions. And so he said that's becoming, we're trying, we're moving different sorts of problems than just the classical fluid dynamics PDEs onto it. Um, one of my other favorites is that Megadroid, somebody's booted two million Android kernels on Jaguar, and then simulated a whole city of Android phones all moving around, and they were sending text messages to each other, and talking to each other, and moving around, and hey, how are you? And, and so that's, that's another, but it's a totally different problem than a fluid dynamic Sure, sure. So. Anybody? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.